Hello and welcome to the Leaders Council podcast. The podcast for the people who run the country and the people who keep the country running. I'm Jonathan White and today we're joined by a man that has served in the cabinet as Home Secretary, Education Secretary and Work and Pension Secretary who led Sheffield City Council during the 1980s before representing the city in Parliament and serves in many roles today including as Vice President of the Royal National Institute of Blind People. Few people are more qualified to talk about the qualities leadership demands and the stresses it causes than he. Lord Blunkett. Uh, we're joined uh, today by uh, David Blunkett, Lord Blunkett, former Home Secretary, former Education Secretary. David, thank you very much for joining us today. You're very welcome. Uh, it's always a pleasure, but uh, since we are talking around the theme of leadership, it would be a remiss of me if we didn't start with the leadership election going on in the Labour Party. Apart from... I'm sure you'll delight that a certain someone is leaving a post. What are your thoughts on it so far? Well, I think the party membership have got to make a very clear decision. Uh, are they in, in the stands watching or are they on the pitch playing? And if they want to play, then the two candidates that are in for the future are Lisa Nandy and Keir Starmer. I'm personally backing Lisa because I think she's a brave woman with a tremendous amount to give. She's got really good, positive ideas. I like them because they're about building from the community rather than command and control from the centre. They're about a new form of social democracy and socialism rather than trying to replicate a failed past. And she can reach out to people that others can't. So I'm, I'm giving her my backing. I think Keir Starmer is very professional Mm. very able and presents extremely well. And I, I hope that one of those two uh, actually come through in the election on the 4th of April. Uh, there has been a lot of criticism, especially from uh, four uh, candidates a little further left um, than them, who've criticised even the last Labour uh, uh, government as being part of 40 years of Thatcherism. Yes, I think it's really unfortunate, uh, particularly when new MPs come in having seen large swathes of their colleagues lose their seat uh, to roll up the 13 years of Labour government with everything that I'm so proud of. I mean, I, we, we were not neoliberals or anything like it. We were able, in the first 10 years certainly, uh, which I played a part in, to be able to turn the economy around, to invest in health and education, to be able to transform people's aspirations and their hopes for the the future, and that included ensuring people got the minimum wage, which we never had before. Sure start to nurture youngsters from the most moment they were born, transformation in the quality of education. And all these things actually add up to helping people to improve and change their lives for the better. And anyone who thinks that's not good and that isn't a government to be proud of needs to answer the question, what shivalet is it? that you would want that would actually have done more to change those lives. I can think of two or three myself in terms mm. of uh, dramatically taking on uh, inequality, although half a million children were taken out of poverty in those years. I can think of being even tougher on crime, even though I was dubbed as one of the tougher home secretaries because the people that I cared about most were, on the whole not exclusively, but mainly the victims of crime, I can think about taking on the very, very rapidly growing transnational power of the big tech companies, which we still need to work through in terms of how we do that from a, a single nation just off the coast of Europe and how we work internationally without getting caught up in wars we don't want to be involved in, but how, how are we international in a way that ensures that we play our part in making a better life for humanity as a whole rather than disengaging and becoming alien from the rest of the world. Th those are big questions for the social democratic left, particularly with artificial intelligence and robotics changing the world of work forever, I think, in the next 20 years. Uh, an ageing population. Labour got 18% of the over 65 vote in the general election. Just 18%. It's staggeringly... It's extraordinary. Staggeringly bad. Um, and and climate change, which we all know is going to be either a big gain or a terrific 
political trauma. We've got to take people with us. No matter uh, which political party it is, the changes that will occur in this decade especially will determine their future ideologies, certainly. And sp- speaking of your time uh, as Home Section in government, um, you worked with so many different individuals of all political stripes and none at all. Is there someone, and on the theme of leadership, that stands out to you that embodies some of those qualities you described earlier? Yes, I mean, I, it's on the theme of bottom-up, it was some of the most inspiring uh, head teachers and classroom teachers who, in really, really difficult circumstances, were actually transforming the life chances of children by inspiring those children to want to learn, to, if you like, lighting a candle inside them, uh, giving them a, a, a window on the world, which created an inquiring mind and an understanding that the world was their oyster, that they could do things with support. My, my philosophy has always been mutuality and reciprocity. We, we need mutuality to support each other. We need reciprocity in terms of understanding that we don't just take, we, we give a lot as well. And I suppose that really comes down to uh, if you're prepared to do something for yourself, we're prepared to do something to help you. And that's fundamentally in education, but it is in all sorts of walks of life as well. So you can have innovation, you can have entrepreneurship and creativity in in business, you can have the way in which people turn things around for themselves. Small businesses have done that. The contribution to uh, new ways of doing things, of thinking differently about our economy. Th- those are all grit to the mill. Those are the things we need to do. And we can do them together. It's not that you're on the side of the devil if you're an entrepreneur or you're on the side of the angels if you work in public services. We, we are mm. dependent on each other. Oh, you can't have one without the other. Yes. Um, and I think to coin a term, uh, uh, extraordinary, ordinary people, and especially when it comes to, given your answer, David, to uh, teachers, to carers, people that honestly don't get the recognition they deserve on a day-to-day basis, and without them, half of society wouldn't function. I completely. I, I call it civil society, which functions even when government isn't functioning. It's what It's the glue that holds things together it's people working and living and having their being together and recognizing that they are dependent on each other i've obviously met incredibly inspiring leaders in a different vein i was very fortunate to have met nelson mandela three times uh i met bill clinton a number of times both of whom in very very different ways were inspiring leaders i've met people in leadership positions who couldn't take a decision to save their lives uh, tony blair famously said in the, his conference speech the year before he stood down as Prime Minister, and I, I knew exactly what he meant. He said the worst ministers are those who won't take decisions, and anyone in a leadership role needs to, A, know why they're there, what they intend to do with the uh, authority mm. that goes with being a leader and a manager, and then how to draw people in as a team to be able to implement it so that it's a team approach. It's not someone out on a white charger. It's someone who can mobilise, motivate, provide incentives for people to feel that they're part of the solution as well. Uh, And I think whether it's politics, whether it's business, whether it's sport, it's exactly those qualities that you need to succeed in any of them. Yes, it is. And if people recognise that and they have a clear idea themselves, they they have and build, because you can't build, leadership qualities... They know how to manage their own time and their own emotions because we all, from time to time, feel like really losing our temper. And I don't pretend for a minute over the years <laughs> that, that I haven't. How, how to control your own feelings and emotion and how to bring the best out in other people's. How, how you work out that people who are really good don't threaten you, they compliment you. People who have complementary skills to you are really valuable and I suppose the ability to listen not just for its own sake Mm -hmm. but to listen because you are conglomerating I suppose you would call it plagiarizing thoughts ideas ways forward from everyone around you I often think that um, football managers wouldn't do too bad a job if they actually talk to the fans after the game 
Well, everyone <laughs> knows, uh, David, you know, you're a big Sheffield Wednesday fan. It I know. It can't be easy having to hear the it, praise of Chris Wilder and Sheffield United every week after week. No, I, it isn't, although it's damn good for Sheffield. So I'm being a bit magnanimous at the moment. That's very good About Sheffield United in the Premier League, because it, it, it does change. It lifts the image of the city internationally. If you're Not just because it's Sheffield United, but because if you're playing Liverpool uh, and you're playing Man City then that's a global audience. You're immediately beamed across the world. So that's good. I, I, I could cry sometimes. We can, we can beat uh, Brighton, Premier League side, in the FA Cup at Brighton. We can beat Leeds at Leeds. I was there when we beat them 2-0 in January. And then you can lose 5-0. And then five you nil lose 5-0 yes. nil at home to Blackburn and half the fans were out of the ground by, by the half time. What, what would a manager blanket say in the situation? I, I would have asked myself a very simple question. What went wrong with motivating those players so that when they came out on the field, they walked instead of ran? They didn't have any of the passion they'd had the week before at Leeds. They showed no drive and incentive to take hold of the game. What, what went wrong with the same players who'd played very well the week previously and if you could answer that question and there may have something may have happened who knows something during the morning before the game started something may have gone sour you get the answer to that question and you then start to ensure that we never never do this again yeah, well i'm a chelsea fan so i'm beginning to feel your pain at the minute um <laughs> but i would like to pick up on another point you just made actually david about choosing a strong team people that compliment you a lot of criticism that uh, Theresa May got as Prime Minister was that she tended not to pick perhaps the more ambitious, the more uh, 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 people uh, uh, ministers that might well challenge her. One of Boris Johnson's, for all his faults, uh, he has been said in the past, he's a man that picks people that are good at their briefs. Do you agree with that? Well, thing? I'll reserve judgment on that until I see the outcome of the reshuffle, which as we record this podcast has not yet happened mm. and I imagine I, I would be very surprised if he didn't have quite a brutal reshuffle not just to get people in who he likes but people who are going to be really sparky and able and clear at doing the job because you can have all the best ideas in the world you can pronounce on what you're going to do but if you haven't got leaders in those departments prepared to do it if they're just toadies by the way and there is a tendency a new mm. prime minister large majority got to be very careful that you don't pick people because you're receiving the echo of your own voice uh, when you're speaking to them but get able people in i, I, I won't comment on some of the less able but there are <laughs> clearly in the cabinet as i speak at the moment people who are really just not up to it i mean incidentally anyone who won't be cross-examined by decent journalists on the BBC, changed their minds recently about mm. Sky, <clears throat> isn't worth their salt. If, but part of being cross-questioned is to demonstrate to yourself that you've got a grasp of your brief, that you believe in it, and that you can persuade people of it. And if you can't do that under real cross-examination rather than sitting on the sofa a, Mm. for a, a, an easy morning television program get out of the business you know don't don't do without it. a doubt yeah uh, that's and also i should add that is how uh these all stripes earn that respect in the first place but there is a question isn't i'm there? trying to answer the questions that's, <laughs> that's what i always tried to answer the or questions. be very good at avoiding them either way um oh well the, the way of avoiding them is to take it head on and say i'm i'm not going to answer that question explain why yeah, quite uh, <laughs> the um and I think that one of the great things about uh, the Lee's Castle especially is that um, it takes and talks to people, again, from all different backgrounds, leading something very different, whether it's a charity, whether it's a business, whether it's in politics. There comes points, though, and David, you must have experienced this, whether it's leading Sheffield City Council or as Home Secretary. When people are looking at you for leadership, where do you get your strength from? I think there's something inside all of us. There's a tenacity, there's a, an ambition, there's a desire to get things done, to make a difference inside you, whether you're in public service, the charities, or you're driving a business that actually says, 
this is why I get up in the morning. So you've got to have something internal to yourself. The, the second is the satisfaction you get back because you do from seeing things change for the better. You, you can take pride without being egotistical. There's nothing wrong with being proud of what you do and to want to do it even better. And that's why you need both sharp minds around you. In my case, it was special advisors as, as well as ministers. I pretty well picked my ministers. Sometimes Tony asked me to take people who I was a little bit iffy about, and we had to meld people into the team. I was able to pick all my own special advisors, and that really did make a difference. Mm. But in, in the end, you've got to like what you're doing. I mean, the, the, the people who are un, unhappy in their skin, they, 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 it's very difficult to perform if you're in the wrong business or in the wrong department of a business or if you're really hating teaching or in politics, you... You're just in the wrong department. I was very lucky because education and employment were my first loves in terms of what I wanted to do, and I got the job for four years. I'd then come to the conclusion that there were really big challenges for us. It turned out even bigger than I expected with the attack on the World Trade Center Mm. three months after I became Home Secretary. But the big challenges of security, of reducing crime, of dealing with... The development of positive citizenship, which also had a readover in terms of immigration, the kind of things that change people's lives either for the better or the worse. And you don't get everything right. That's the other thing you've got to recognise, which is why being part of a broader team, being able to take criticism but not always accept it <laughs> because otherwise you blow with the wind, that, that, that's the, the measure and I think if we can share those traits, those experiences, those different elements through the Leadership Council, if we can get people from very, very different leadership managerial roles and delivery roles to actually be able to share that experience, everyone will gain something from it because that dialogue will inform, it will avoid people reinventing the wheel it will take people a lot further than the, the niche, for good or ill, the niche that they're in at the moment. Um, David, in the, very, uh, in the couple of minutes we have left, um, I will be mean and put you on the spot and ask you for predictions perhaps in three things. What will happen in the Labour Leadership Contest? How will the next few months go for the government after Brexit? Uh, well, after we leave the European Union on the 31st of January? And where will Sheffield... Wednesday finish in the league? Lord above. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure which is the most difficult of those <laughs> questions. I, I've already in, indicated where my support is for the, the Labour leadership. If we take it at the end of January 2020, Keir Starmer has clearly got, a, got off to a very, very um, strong start. I think, however, it will be very much down to who can reach... Those parts of the Labour Party membership that came in on the back of Jeremy Corbyn's election in 2015 to that post, who can be persuaded that what they want to see and the change, the big changes they'd like to enact can only be brought about in any form if we win and we win back the people, the tragic loss of people on our side uh, mm. in December 2019. Uh, and that, that's that got to be Lisa Nandy or, or Keir. On, on the, um, the, the next few months, I think that the government will probably do quite well. I, I, I think that there are real dangers ahead in just having 11 months to negotiate trade deals, especially with bellicose pronouncements about we're not going to have alignment, as though... Alignment in itself is a bad thing when some of it will be very good. So I think there are dangers, but I think there's quite a bit of momentum going with the government at the moment, and that will be reflected in relationships, in doing deals in Europe and facing outwards to the rest of the world. Sheffield Wednesday, God help me. I mean, you know, how is it that two of the things that are most important to me, other than my family and loved ones, is football and and politics... I think Sheffield Wednesday will be hard-pressed now to get into the playoffs 
if we do, I think we could pull it off. But I am really reluctant. And I think on that prediction, your reputation will be judged. Lord Blunkett, thank you very much for joining us today. God bless you, Jonathan. This has been the Leaders' Council podcast. Thank you for celebrating excellence in leadership with us. I've been your host, Jonathan White. Until next time, goodbye. Thank you for listening to our podcast. The views expressed within the podcast do not reflect the views of the Leaders' Council of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, its parent company or subsidiaries, members of staff, other guests, or any other person therein associated.